Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. I like to tell people that people don't hang out here because, like, I'm real friendly and, and bubbly and everybody gets along. People well, hang- that is one of the many reasons. Yeah. People, people hang out here because they make money here. Like, they do better here than they do out on their own. Hey there, everybody. It's Wednesday. It's Scott, and it's the Pitchworks Podcast talking to you about presenting your ideas at work. Guess what? Big event coming up on the 20th of May. If you are here in Pittsburgh, we're doing a seminar. It's Pitchworks and the Outsourced Sales Manager. Sign up for that on Eventbrite. You can go to pitchworks.com and find the link for that right on the front page. If you're curious how to spell Pitchworks, it's P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S. That's the website. That's all of the various social channels as well. You'll find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, If you're sitting around, you're feeling lonely, you don't know who to talk to, hit up your friend Scott. Maybe we can have a chat about sales and marketing and podcasts and startups and things. I'd be glad to hear from you, and uh, I'll make you feel a little bit less lonely. So since I'm doing that for you, do me a favor. Get into iTunes. Give us a rating. Five stars. This is a great program, and Scott comforted me in my time of need. One star. I'm not sure about Scott. He seems a little sketch and he's a little clingy. Anyway, either way is fine. Uh, Just do us a favor. Give us the rating and review so that people know how we're doing. So today we're talking to Josh Lucas. He is the founder of Work Hard Pittsburgh. He's the co-founder of Academy and they just got great news. All right. Today we're talking to Josh Lucas, founder of Work Hard Pittsburgh, co-founder of Academy Pittsburgh. Josh, how are you? I'm fantastic. I'm happy to be here. Man, I'm really glad. I think, if I'm right, I'm the first person to invite you in, at least from you know behind the microphone, to congratulate you on a recent victory. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Uh, so this week, we uh, got news that the Allegheny County Economic Office of Development is awarding us a CITF grant uh, for uh, the property acquisition associated with the co-op. That's fantastic. That a fantastic. CITF, what does that stand for? Oh, I should have wrote that one down. It's essentially uh, money that's put aside by uh, the taxes levied on the casino to oh, okay. do things with uh, economic development or education. It's the money the casino pays back into the community to make sure that there's a positive, net positive effect for that. Uh, endeavor. And I want to make sure everybody that's listening understands the show comes from within Work Hard Pittsburgh. Like the the Epicast Network is actually um, you know headquartered here. The studios here, you know, on the the lower level. Um, so this is a big local win for us. It's going to be a huge deal. So in the next six months, say you know we'll purchase about nine thousand square feet of commercial real estate up here. That's tremendous. And uh, the cool thing about it is that it's cooperatively owned. So our membership are are going to be the owner operators of of this whole system. So let's go back to the very beginning. I do want to get to the grant, but I want to I want to start with how did you decide to even get into the co working space? As, yeah. as something that occupies so much of your time. So I will, I'll fight that as a definition of, of, of what we do here. Um, I taught high school chemistry, uh, as many people know, who will probably be listening to this for, for 13 years in an economically depressed school district just west of the city of Pittsburgh. Nice. Um, it was very rewarding there for a bit, and then it was very exhausting soon thereafter. Uh, and knew that I, I needed to do something different uh, just to ensure that I was satisfied with, with what I was doing globally in, in my life choices. Right. Yeah. So in around, so wait, are we talking about like you had, you had some trigger event that made it so that this became exhausting. I don't think you, it was a trigger event. I think it was, um, you said something like it, it, all of a sudden it became or Yeah. I mean, I, I think that sure in that last narrow six months or so of, of my career as a public school teacher, there were definitely triggering events. But I think the general thing that most teachers get frustrated with and get burnt out with is the ineffectiveness of, of the adults that are managing the programming, right? I come from a family of teachers. I've heard this story. Yeah. And it's it's not just at a local level. It drips up to the state level and federal level. And uh, there's just so much built in uh, system-wide 
stupidity that uh, at some point in time, uh, either you burn out and leave or you burn out and do a horrible job. So I chose to burn out and, and leave rather than burn out and, and stay and, and do a less than adequate job. It was, seemed unfair to me to stick around and collect that paycheck and, and be responsible for 100 or so children's education every year. So, you know, I I wrapped up teaching. I've always dabbled in entrepreneurship, ran recording studio with Young Buzzy over there uh, at some point in the past. Uh, My business partner and I have done real estate. Always something a side gig. I come from an entrepreneurial family uh, in a in a weird way. My mom was always selling and buying antiques, and we uh, my dad raised dogs on the side. There was always something nice. small businessy, weird hustle going on in, in the neighborhood, kind of thing. Um, so you know, in 2011, uh, tried to think of something interesting we could do, something that. Uh, would be compelling and engaging intellectually because I, I wasn't feeling that reward uh, for my day job. And, and that's when we launched uh, a little startup called Red Blue Voice. It was crowdfunding of political speech. Nice. So you can imagine a web platform where you can upload the same 30-second TV ads that you see every election season and then crowdfund the, the ad buy, the distribution. Mm-hmm. And that's what the company did and, and tried to make money doing was doing those ad buys and those distributions. Uh, with the strength of that and some corporate interest uh, on a, on a, from a national brand. Um, we got into Alpha Lab and went through uh, IW's programming to uh, get incubated or receive incubation and try to develop the product. Um, had a contract in hand. Uh, it was predatory and sort of had a lot of unfavorable terms. Never. Of course. And, and to be expected, Never. right? Like we're a tiny startup. This is a big national brand. So we pushed back a little bit. Uh, and come to find out that they had this conversation going on with 20 other startups all over the country yeah. and weren't interested in negotiating. They were just, you know, if it falls in our lap, great. If yeah. not, have a nice day. And that was kind of the end of that. Well, you said it's a great big national company. So, I mean, right. the, the, the money that's a lot to you is not a lot of money to them. Right. Now, now you mentioned Innovation Works, which yeah. for people that are outside of Pittsburgh, it's you know, one of our uh, our local sort of incubator, accelerator type of programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to believe that they were sitting on your side of the table through all this, though, and they were advising Absolutely. You. Yeah, and, and IW and Alpha Lab um, did a great job with us, I think, in, in retrospect. Um, you know, they're a nationally respected accelerator slash incubator and have their hands in countless numbers of companies that have been wildly successful here in yeah. the region. Everything from A-Lung to No Weight and uh, Shoe Fitter. So some so real brands that have either gone on to develop or been acquired by people like Amazon and other big mm-hmm. uh, tech companies. So there's most startup technology success that's come out of Pittsburgh in the last decade has come from that uh, lineage or family line of of. Yeah, they're in everything. They yeah, are, they're absolutely sure. in everything locally. I was just curious because as you're telling the story, I had to know how it ended with, you know, back then we weren't really talking startups as much around here. No, n- not as much, but there had already been a class or two. Th- there had already been a cycle or two through of successes. Right? Oh, yeah. So there were people could point to companies and go, that's a success. That was a $40 million exit. Everybody walked away with a million, two million, yeah. right? That kind of thing. Um so when that re- when that looked like it was a real thing, you know, when we had a contract in hand, and it, w- it wasn't going to be a huge windfall for us, but you know, it was going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue for us a year, and and that's a lot to us, Absolutely. especially in Pittsburgh, right? Um, we secured the space we're sitting in today as going to, as a shared collaborative environment where we could curate talent and develop talent. So we always had strong connections in content marketing and media and sort of web development, and we thought, well. We have just enough money to have an office space, so why not make it a co-working space? Because that way we'll always have subcontractors at hand to do work for us. And as we mature and as we generate revenue, the ones we like, we'll just hire on. And the ones we don't like, we'll just let them sit in our space and pay us rent. Didn't you just challenge me a minute ago when I characterized (laughs) it as a co-working space? I I did, but that was in 2012. Okay. I think we've moved way beyond that at at this point Um, because our interest now isn't so much in the subleasing of physical space to startups and remote workers and entrepreneurs. You know, I, I don't think that the math works out in a market like Pittsburgh to make that worth anybody's time. Okay. Right? Like I can charge $500 a desk upstairs and make money and have an employee to flush the toilets and wipe down the desks, right? Right. 
or I could charge $45 a month upstairs and, and really build a robust community full of talented people that we can leverage in other ways to generate revenue. Mm-hmm. And so this idea that we're here subleasing space to someone and, and that's our economic model or our revenue model, that just seems silly to me. In, well, it's not your Pittsburgh. value for certain, right? You've built yeah. a nice community here. Um, but yeah, I, I was curious there because on some level it is co-working, you know I mean? It, it, it's definitely more than that. Well, but there are certain people that maybe look at you first with co-working in mind. Is that a fair statement? That's probably fair if they, if they cold call us off the web, right? Yeah, right. So yeah. they're doing a Google search and they're trying to figure out a place mm-hmm. where their kids aren't screaming in the background that they can... Work. Right, right. So I, I guess my pushback on this is that I am committed this year to no longer reducing the complexity of what we do, do, have done, right? I'm, right. I'm, I guess, and this is completely selfish, um, but I'm, I'm really over apologizing for our inherent complexity. We get a lot of criticism through the ages, actually, that we um, don't just do a simple linear thing uh, and just do what everybody else is doing and have the same sales pitch. Who's criticizing? Oh, many, many mentors. Let me ask you Many, many, way. many, many years. Whose criticism do you care about? Nobody's in at that this point. Regard. Yeah, nobody's at this point. Well, those two very important differences, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. And and to be fair, some of the criticism uh, is constructive, right? You know, if people are confused or if our message is muddled, which it has been in the past, for uh, for sure has been, as we've like tried to figure Like every other out. startup ever. Right. But as we've gotten more mature and as we've had a year to, or a year, more than that probably, two years to push this narrative of cooperatively organized business incubation, uh, I don't feel compelled to be a reductionist about what that means and the potential impact that can have. So what was the grant decision based on? How did they choose who got the money and who didn't? I don't really have, I think, well, a lot of clarity on that. I can tell you- It was you, an application process, It was absolutely an application process. Right, and it yeah. had to be, these things take forever. So this money is uh, set aside to improve the economic situation of Allegheny County, right? Very so good. economic development. And um, you know everything from the Carnegie Library to uh, nonprofits to folks like us have in the past been able to receive it. You know, like most people in- um, our great city and our, our great surrounding region, people are interested in lowering the barrier to entry for, for entrepreneurship and finding ways to give more and different kinds of people economic opportunity. Right. Because the current status quo systems that maybe have been in place for the last 20 or so years, they've been successful, but they've been successful narrowly. And now people want to broaden that lane and have a bigger boat full of more people on board, getting more things done and, and having more opportunities to grow their business. Whether that's a fancy startup that's going for acquisition and a hundred million dollar exit or the guy down the street who just wants to have a taco truck, right? Right. Like all of those things require, both of those things require very similar resources in an odd sort of way. It's just a matter of scale sometimes. And it's a matter of complexity of delivery. So I think that the reason why we were awarded uh, this grant is because what we wrap our story in is this idea that a community that self-organizes itself to do entrepreneurship is better equipped than a hierarchy that's organizing a community to do entrepreneurship. That these peer-to-peer relationships between, you know, Epicast and Black Forge Coffee and Academy Pittsburgh and Looking for Group and Ryan Haggerty Media and uh, Syntax, a web development firm here, those peer-to-peer relationships, there's a lot of inherent value in there. And there's actually commoditizable uh, exchange of services that can save both parties money and reduce overhead as people try to start and scale their business. This is the co-op part. This, this is, is the, the bit where part. everybody starts to play together. That's right. And, and giving those people in the co-op some um, a measurement of, of, of ownership of the process is how you get buy-in, right? right. I, I like to tell people that people don't hang out here because like, I'm real friendly and, and bubbly and everybody gets along. People well, ha- that is one of the many reasons. Yeah. People, people hang out here because they make money here. Like They do better here than they do out on their own. And we've done a lot of work over the last three years to create that environment and process and, and, and job flow into the co-op so that you know whether you're a freelance web developer or someone who's starting a business but needs a secondary income, there's income coming in this place that we spread out through the, through the cooperative to keep people uh, engaged in the things that they're really pursuing. So you had a good story for their their need, which mm-hmm. was economic development. Right. Okay, so step one, I guess, is be a quality organization. 
right? But that's mm-hmm. not nearly all of it, right? The first thing is, I would think you'd have to even know that the grant process can, is available. Is there even a grant? So how do you find out about it? Uh, Someone came to you or you found it on the web or? We we probably found it, right? Like we've been in, for this takes years. So I don't want to reduce the time on task, but but we have been writing these sorts of grants for a solid two and a half years now. Um, and through that, you learn about the different things that are available almost organically through through your network, right? Through mm-hmm. leveraging different people that are either advocates for you or or interested in, in what you're doing. And, and also leveraging people that have already funded you. Obviously, if somebody gives you money, they'd like to see you get more money, uh, especially in this sort of public good impact space, because they don't want you to fail after they give you a chunk of money. They want you to continue forward and, and continue to mature. And I'm reading between the lines. You and your friends, again, are the answer to the question. Like you and your friends had your eyes open for, hey, you know, tell me if you see a grant that applies to what we're trying to do. Yeah. This whole team thing figures into this answer as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's that. I think it's very true. I think that's very astute, right? Um, there is a good deal of networking and politicking wrapped into all this. You, you mm-hmm. can't be successful in these programmings. In, in these sorts of pursuits, if you are not putting yourself out there and consistently telling a story that has some inherent value to either the political class, the affluent class, the, the funder class, the aristocracy of Pittsburgh, right? Absolutely. They're doing it because they have a goal that they've been that's right. tasked with. And that's not a bad thing. Like the, I, don't wanna, I don't want to paint that as a negative thing. That's just the nature of human interaction. Uh, and, and the only way to to get good at that is time on task because these relationships only bear fruit after people have vetted you subconsciously and consciously, right? Like right. P- very purposefully and, and also just being around you enough to know that, that, that outward exterior is the truth of the matter. I like to tell people that sales is about explaining to the buyer that you are like them mm-hmm. or that people like them buy from you, mm-hmm. right? It's a, it's an identity question. So you're in these circles and they say, Josh is the kind of person that we invest in, mm-hmm. or Josh and his team are the kind of people we invest in. Yeah. It, it really is a question about who you are and who you think you are and who you aspire to mm-hmm. be. And that's clear narrative. And, and I do think that figures into what were they looking for in this process? Is this the type of organization that we invest in, right? Yes. You were going through this process. Did you have any sense of how many other people were applying for it? Did you know what the competition looked like? <sighs> yeah, there's there was a number floated there at some point. I, I feel like it was in the hundreds. Don't well, don't quote me on that, even though I'm a podcast being quoted on it. Um, Triple but, digits is significant. Yeah, there's a lot of people apply for it. Um, and, you know, I, I think what our complexity is a disadvantage and an advantage, right? Like our big ticket thinking and the ideas that we put forward onto the marketplace that this is radically different uh, helps us and it hurts us, right? Right. Because I can go to someone and say, we're radically different and here's how the status quo is failing people. So you have to help me test if this is the solution. And, and most reasonable people buy into that side of the story. Well, I'm going to stop you right there. It's because you said, help me test, right? Right. I don't think, and I obviously I'm not, I don't get a vote on the grant. If you came to me and said, I have the solution, mm-hmm. you'd lose me. Absolutely. The fact that you said, here's how I'd like to test to see if we have a better way. You haven't shaken me out yet. Like I haven't left the party yet. Right. Well, and that's also, I think setting someone up psychologically to, to accept more information, mm-hmm. right? Like you're, you're making them a participant in this wild, crazy ride. And so if it works, they're going to have some sense of accomplishment and get some credit for it as, as well. Absolutely. Right? As well they should, honestly, it, because there are a million potential yeah. paths that this could take. And right. this is one that could work. And if it fails, they just walk away and go, well, he was testing. All right. So I, I'd be wasting your visit if I didn't try to pick your brain about something very similar to that. So reaching into the zeitgeist, reaching into, you know, so sort of what's the current fashion, what are the startups that are working? What are the things that are Maybe yeah. truly tapping into something that people are starting that you're seeing, you know, being a trend. 
Well, so I think finally we're being honest about only startups that are generating revenue getting funding in this market. Oh, Uh, yeah. That's a common problem. I think for the longest time, we were strongly adopting this narrative of West Coast entrepreneurship, which works well out there because it's capitalized, right? It's well capitalized and there's uh, a lot of uh, risk-taking investors. Well, if you're talking about the Valley, you're also talking, though, that losing money is a means to talent acquisition as well. Absolutely. There's just so many more pathways that those things can go when they go wrong. Right. Right? So if I want Josh to come work for my startup, I invest $500,000 in the one he's working on. And I sit back and I wait for it to fail. (laughs) And he remembers that I'm the guy that gave him a half million dollars. I guess I'll go do the CTO Ah, role. Scott's okay, I guess. Uh, I'll PM for him for a couple of years. Yeah. Next thing you know, I've got Josh in the stable and it cost me a half a million dollars. Sure. But the next thing that I do with my company might profit 10 times that. Yeah. And so Pittsburgh doesn't have that, right? Yeah. We have risk averse capital. In a long time, I think, and this is, I think, honest and fair, and people push back against this, but there was a false narrative in town that if you just had a cool, hip idea um, and knew the right people and got a nice product put together and a good MVP and had a little bit of customer traction, you could raise enough money to go forward. And this just not was not true. <laughs> uh, the only folks in town that were really ever getting invested in were people that were revenue generating. And the more revenue you generated, obviously, the better off you were. And don't forget, there was a se- special subsection for names they already knew. Yeah. Right? If you were a sure. name that had already yeah, yeah, yeah. been through the process, yeah. the rules were slightly different for you. Absol- absolutely. And by slightly, I mean absolutely completely. And you would have a check <laughs> in your mailbox without asking. But that's that, another question for that's, another day. That, that is another question. There's some good examples that we could uh, point to, I'm you sure. We'll wait until the recorder's off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I think now people are being more honest about that. I think people are being really upfront in saying, look, if you aren't generating revenue, don't bother everybody asking for money because it's just not going to be there for you. Yeah. So uh, startups like Icos, I-K-O-S, um, is sort of like the Uber for uh, real estate showings. Mm-hmm. Um, they're in town and, um, I think it's public knowledge, but I hope so. They've done a a pretty significant round with Birchmere and IW, uh, not because they had technology product. They didn't even bother developing the web app of it because they had Excel spreadsheets, boots on the ground, revenue generating. There's money. Uh Uh-huh. And dozens of customers (laughs) uh, that were paying significant monthly amounts of money to, to show and put, do put real estate on the market. Josh, what you just said is, is critically important because- and, and I'm going to take advantage of it because it fits so well into, into literally what the show is about week in, week out, right? Uh, nothing happens until something is sold. This mm-hmm. is an old sales mm-hmm. slogan is nothing happens. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the funniest memories of my youth is we were sitting on the couch and somebody was talking about how the president doesn't create jobs and they started to trail off. My dad jumped right back in and goes, salespeople create jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You literally have to go out and and make a transaction happen. Yeah. And And that's why salespeople, marketing people, those kinds of things, they end up in startups so often is because they're used to the idea of generating that first dollar. Well, two things on that, right? Like our strategy here is exactly that. Like we won't build a product until we've sold the product. Yeah. Uh, And we're, we're, Toying with some hardware stuff upstairs that we've we've kind of internally prototyped, but we won't try to take that and 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 we won't patent anything. We won't spend any significant money. We won't even develop an MVP on that until David Tusik, the sales guy attached to that, goes out and sells five, six, seven thousand dollars of 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 what we think is fair for what what we're doing. Um, and then sort of the second thing that I'll, I'll swing back around on is that. You know, if the marketplace of, of of the entrepreneurial marketplace isn't honest about that, you get distorted thinking, right? Like if you have a bunch of first-time entrepreneurs in the community saying, "Okay, I'm going to take the plunge. I'm going to I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it," and they invest their time and their money to develop some sort of MVP without first selling that product, what you're doing is you're you're wasting talent. You're squandering that talent because they're going to fail, and they only got really one economic shot to do this. They're going to burn out, and they're going to have to go back to their day jobs. Yep. So that's one of the reasons that we we structured this our system the way we structured it because we don't want people to have to go back to their day jobs. You know, we want you to come in here eyes wide open, know that you got to sell your product before you spend any money and time on it. And then, you know, if it doesn't work out, that's, that's perfectly possible. That's actually one of the most likely outcomes. It's the the most likely outcome, right? I was trying not to put it so starkly. I caught myself, but thank you. That's the truth. I mean, the honest truth is the most likely outcome is 
It just doesn't go anywhere. But if there are creative systems in place to catch that entrepreneur and keep him economically afloat, he can move laterally and use his talent in a different place in, in inside the co-op, or he can start his next thing uh, because he has a system and process and, and a, a, um, a rhythm to fall in here. He's not going to live lavishly, or she. He's no. He's not going to you know, live in Mount Lebanon in a $600,000 house and have a BMW, but he can continue to pursue the things, or she can continue to pursue the things that, that they're interested in. Um, and, and that's really what we're trying to answer in this system. Everyone wants to be like Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley is a talent engine. It is an acquisition engine for talent. They bring people, I've, I've, I'm going to be out there in a, in a few weeks. Uh, we're doing a road trip out there to, uh, uh, to go do some in-person interviews because I just don't really like the sound of remotes. I, I hate remote interviews, but um, the people that I know out there, how about this? The way I got to know Silicon Valley is because they stole good friends of mine out there. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't have that talent acquisition engine here in place. I, th I think where we're, we're disconnect, where we're disconnecting is that Pittsburgh startups don't ever pay salaries to people. You know, if I'm on the West Coast with a with a normal seed round, I uh, see where you're at. Uh, you're I'm going to hire about. a real engineer. I'm not going to ask the engineer to do 150 hours of free work for me uh, as a favor and five percent of see, my. See, I see uh, that as a uh, maturity problem. And they, well, I think it's a it's a risk averse investor class problem. If you're in Pittsburgh, you know that you're the big fish in the small pond, and you have this sense that you can exert influence that other people in other places like D.C., New yeah, York, San Francisco be wouldn't try to exert that power because they'd be afraid of losing the deal. Right. In Pittsburgh, they're not afraid of losing the deal because there's not <laughs> enough people yet. Yeah. So do you think it's fair to say that because there's a lack of competition between the investor class here in town, that there's a lack of deal flow? Yes. Yeah, I would, I would say that's one of the core problems here in town is that there are four or five groups of people that do all the investing and they kind of collude. They're, none of them are uh, really competing for deals. They all kind of go in on deals together. Uh, or they have their specialty that they stay with and everybody else knows that that's therefore it, yeah. they can cherry pick a deal that's outside of that lane. Yeah, And, and that, that lack of comp competition is what creates an environment that underfunds startups. Yep. And uh, also imposes um, sometimes, sometimes not too much influence in that startup. Uh, Why does a Valley engineer make so much money? Because yeah. fifteen people gave him offer letters. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to get paid a lot of money, yeah. and you work for Google, walk across the street to Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> tell them you're a Googler. Sit back. Step three: profit. <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh, and thank you for getting that. Yeah. The uh, uh, same example exists here, but we're still in that rub two six and blow phase of it, right? You know, we're trying to create that fire where you can walk across the street. I mean, Google has an office here, right? Uber is here. Uh, Everybody's here now. It's some well, in some way or another. To varying degrees, right? But I mean, those two actually have a good, good deal of of floor space filled with people, not robots, not mm -hmm. inventory. Uh, but even then the people that, that would start the next thing, which would create our own culture. It's not quite fire yet. It's heat, it's smoke, but it's not fire. We haven't had the sizable enough exits to create new money. Yeah. That is actually a tremendously insightful comment because one of the funniest things I learned in my early education on this whole subject, and I was a salesperson who was trying to get into starting my own thing because I could see the pain that I could solve. Mm -hmm. Just give me that pain point and I can solve it. That I can translate that value into cash flow. And somebody said, nope, nobody wants to get on an airplane to come see what they invested in. So unless you can find somebody in your hometown who thinks that you've really cracked this code, you can't have our money from New York, DC, mm -hmm. you know, any of the places that we mentioned. We do need to create that, that new investor class. Mm -hmm. Younger, more willing to take risks, uh, someone who's lived something that's relevant to business practice in the last 15 years, say. Someone who came up through our processes. Yeah, too. somebody who came through this last decade of entrepreneurship, not old legacy industry money or you know enterprise money. Well, we have a love for hardware here that other people don't have. That's why Alpha Lab Gear is so successful and world renowned is the fact that they're really, really good at it, and that's a Pittsburgh thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, actually, they just concluded the hardware cup. Right, right. You right, know, right. I mean, yeah, that yeah. was what two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, other people will grab other parts of it, 
you know, somebody will be the mobile app champion. Someone will be well, the well, economic uh, and financial sector champion. That's we like to New York, think right? that the co-op's going to grab a chunk of that and create some competitive advantage, right? Sure. Because if this place is cranking out successful businesses that make money and generate generate profit, uh, then the need for that early stage money it becomes less necessary, and and then people are going to have to be more thoughtful about when they take it and, and, and people that want to be in early are going to have to be more lenient with the deal flow and the deal terms that they're trying to impose on, on folks. You know what we need to get back to? You need to tell everybody about Academy because I think it's a brilliant program. So that's a good tie-in actually because Academy Pittsburgh is the first product of the co-op. So the co-op owns half of Academy Pittsburgh and the instructor owns the other half. It's just a 12-week web developer boot camp. They're all over the country. Ours is a little different in that we reserve half of our slots for folks that are underrepresented in tech. So women, minorities, um, veterans, uh, Latinos, African Americans. I really like the sort of thing that the, the we're trying to fix that problem before it gets started here. I think so too. I think that's one of Pittsburgh's, and some people would disagree with this maybe, but I think that's one of the coolest things about Pittsburgh is that the discussion around diversity is being uh, acted upon in, in real tangible, measurable ways. It's not just a lot of lip service. There are real strongly positioned advocates that are doing things that are g- going to generate economic opportunities for different kinds of people. One of the things I want to ask you while I have you here is that if somebody wants to hire one of these academy graduates, how mm-hmm. do they do that? Uh, they can shoot me or the instructor an email. They can go through any of the staffing agencies in town. We have relationships with with all of them. Um, they, we didn't, anybody who's seriously interested in sort of hiring an entry-level web dev from an unconventional background, we routinely have companies come in, hang out for a day, meet people, sort of have long tail interview processes where they get to interact. They can send us projects to work on. We'll let the people solve. We'll let our participants or our students solve those projects. There's any number of ways that folks want to creatively engage our, 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 our program people. Uh, we, we'd love to, we'd love to have it. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on you, Josh. If anybody wants to reach out and get in touch, how would they do that? Uh, info at workhardpgh.com and on social media at workhardpgh and at academypgh. I really brought you in here to talk about, you know, like how these these grant you know, mm-hmm. applications and pitches work. As you can tell, we had a lot more to talk about there. Yeah. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much, Scott. It was a good time. Thanks, man. All right, that's it for this week. Josh Lucas, thank you so much for coming in. It's really nice to get you behind the microphone finally and talk about the success that you had and and continue to have. Uh, If you haven't been to work hard, you should probably make a point of at least checking it out. There's there's a lot of cool buzz around here. If you've got an idea that you're thinking about bringing to market, you want to start something up. The work hard people really are building something interesting. Again, don't forget, May 20th, get there through the website and sign up for getting started in sales up in Cranberry. Otherwise, I will just wait another seven days and talk to you then. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart, LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P-I-T-C-H-W-E-R-K-S.